Hello everyone, uh, this lecture is about the transients which represent one of the most extreme phenomena in the cosmos. I have divided this lecture into four parts. I will start with introducing what are transients and then I will get into some physics of the transients and then I will tell you some of the recent results and latest development in this field and finally, I will give you some of the resources if you want to get more knowledge, gather more knowledge on these sources. So, what are transients? Transients represent one of the extreme phenomena in the universe. Why do I say that? Because in our universe, where universe itself is 14 billion years old, the stars live from several million to billions of years even the nearest star is 4 light years away from us. Any astronomical phenomena which is happening on a milliseconds to few months time scale is certainly representing, re representing the extremes in the astrophysics and they are usually associated with explosive or very dynamic event which is associated with extreme amount of energies. For example, when I say 10 to the power 51 ergs energy, you may not realize the enormity of this energy, but I would like to tell you that if you carry out the most explosive nuclear bomb on earth, this energy is 29 orders of magnitude higher than that kind of energy. It also represents the magnetic fields which are extremely strong and you cannot recreate in the laboratories on earth. So, in this lecture, I will discuss four kinds of transients, uh, one are supernovae, then gamma ray bursts, then of course, one of the most uh, popular these days are gravitational waves, electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves and fast radio bursts. So, supernovae, supernovae are flashes of light in the sky seen from random directions and these are one of the oldest known transients and they have see, been seen historically as early as 11th century. And in fact, in this slide, I will show you some of the galactic supernovae remnants. Uh, I am sure you must have heard the names of these supernovae, Crab, Tycho, Kepler and Cassiopeia A. These are all in our galaxy and these are all real images of these supernovae remnants taken with uh, various kinds of telescopes. These supernovae are, uh, have not been seen in our galaxy since 17th century, but we do see them in other galaxies and we see them actually very uh, frequently. In fact, just to tell you every second in the universe, there are some 8 such supernovae explosions and the energy emitted in these explosions are as much as uh, energy emitted from the whole galaxy containing 100 billions of stars. The supernovae are classified based on uh, optical spectroscopy and they are called uh, core collapse supernovae or thermonuclear supernovae and I will get to in these uh, supernovae in a while. Now, gamma ray bursts, gamma ray bursts were uh, are one of the newer transients, they were discovered only in uh, 1960s and when one gamma ray burst happens, the energy in gamma rays, it actually outshines rest of the universe. It is that energetic explosion. The duration of these bursts are from fraction of seconds to few minutes. These are collimated events. What does that mean? That these are very directional events. We do see them only when they are pointing towards earth. When they are not pointing towards earth, we are not seeing them. What does that mean? That means that if we are seeing one gamma ray burst towards us, we must be missing at least 500 to 600 such bursts. Yet we observe almost one burst a day and this is because of some of the very sensitive NASA telescopes which are revolving around the earth and looking for these events. And these events are 100 times more energetic than supernovae which itself outshines whole of the galaxy. Based on the duration, which is whether it is more than 2 seconds or less than 2 seconds, they can be classified either as long gamma ray bursts and short gamma ray bursts. And here I am showing you this uh, animation of a gamma ray burst. You see on your left uh, this uh, galaxy, 
not galaxy sorry the universe in gamma rays and on the top you see this little dot and on the right hand side you see the time and the energy and you see for a few seconds when it the burst happens this little dot is actually brighter than rest of the universe. So, this is how bright these events are even though they are very erratic events in this diagram also I am showing you the time on the x axis and energy on the y axis. You see there is only one common thing and the common thing is this burst of energy lasting for a few seconds. What I want to say is that they come in all shapes and uh, all kinds of gamma ray bursts exist, but in all the cases there are these huge outbursts of energy. All right. Electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves, this is one of the most exciting topics these days because gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein in 1916 and they are the consequence of general theory of relativity, but it took us almost 100 years to detect these gravitational waves. According to this theory, gravitational waves are nothing but ripples in the curvature of space time and when a mass is accelerated, it deforms the shape of the space and then this deformation can propagate with the speed of light. But if we have these astronomical phenomena which are undergoing violent acceleration, which I will come to it in a while, these can produce a strong enough gravitational waves that we can detect uh, with our instruments on earth now. And electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave is sim a simple way of saying that detecting light from these events. Okay, and so far only 5 gravitational wave events are known, uh, One only one has the electromagnetic counterpart. Again I will describe the physics of these gravitational waves, electromagnetic or photons or light from these gravitational waves in a while. Okay, here I am showing you a very exaggerated diagram of gravitational wave, this consider this the top cartoon diagram as space time and space time is deforming and uh, below these are the polarizations of gravitational waves and if you see these particles the way they are uh, being squished and stretched this is happening because of the movement of gravitational waves and this is what we, uh, we try to uh, discover on earth. However, I am telling you that this is an extremely exaggerated diagram because the first gravitational wave we detected for that gravitational wave, the size of earth changed only by one thousandth of a proton width or in other words, if you take the nearest star alpha century, you have to move that star by one hair width and that kind of displacement we have observed with our most sensitive tele, uh, interferometers which are detecting gravitational waves. All right, fast radio bursts these are the most exotic yet enigmatic objects transients they last only for few milliseconds duration they have been seen only in the radio wavelengths we still do not know what causes them we know 35 such events we have no clue what these things are and they were they are one of the latest discoveries in astronomy and all the astronomers working in transient science are puzzled by these fast radio bursts. Okay, so now this is the part 2 of this lecture where I will describe some of the physics which is guiding these kind of transient phenomena. And I want to start with telling you that in the heart of these almost all transients which you have seen are all representing some kind of explosive event lies a very massive star, a star at least 10 times more massive than our sun and that is responsible for these extreme phenomena. So, the diagram you can see here is a very famous diagram called Hertzsprung Russell diagram. In this diagram on the x axis you can see time, uh, it is the temperature of a star going from right to left. It is actually little counterintuitive because generally when we plot the diagram we plot from left to right, but this is a historical diagram and for historical reasons uh, which I am not clear why. Uh, the, the, the temperature increases from right to left 
and then on the y axis you see the luminosity or intensity or brightness from the star. Our sun is lying somewhere on the lower right corner here and as you go up and left you see the massive stars, as you go right and down you see the less massive stars and this thin long line represents the main sequence stars. What are main sequence stars? The stars which are giving rise to energy by doing the nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium. These are main sequence stars and it is the mass of these stars which decide the fate of the star. For example, if I show you in this diagram, this is where our sun is. Okay, when sun when it ends its life, it will become a white dwarf. A star which is less massive than sun will most likely become a brown dwarf. However, stars which are very massive, they will all end their lives as an explosion and these are the explosions we are talking about. So, let us try to understand why these explosions are happening and for that let us start with our sun. How does sun give rise to energy? Inside the sun there is a nuclear fusion in which hydrogen is being converted into helium and that is giving rise to these photons or this light which is moving outward which means which is providing a counterpart of the gravity force which is trying to contract the star. So, these photons because of this nuclear fusion are not only giving us light, but also keeping the sun stable. Now, inside the sun the temperature is 10 million Kelvin and even though it sounds like a very high temperature, this temperature is not enough to do the fusion of heavier elements. So, sun will not have too much of fusion once all the hydrogen is exhausted, uh, it will be lot of helium and then some of the helium will convert into carbon and oxygen because of fusion and then sun will become a white dwarf. So, this is a fate of sun and we still have 4.5 billion years uh, for such a fate to come. However, what happens if a star is say 10 or 15 times more massive than the sun? In such a star, the temperature at the core is 1000 times more than the temperature at the core of sun, which is around 10 billion Kelvin. Now, such a temperature is, is enough to carry out further nuclear fusion reactions. What does that mean? Is that hydrogen is burning into helium, helium into oxygen carbon, into silicon and then finally, iron. So, you have this onion light like structure which I am showing you in this top left diagram. So, after the iron what happens? Since iron is the most stable element, there is no more fusion reaction possible and then what will happen? A star which is evolving for millions of years creating all these heavy elements inside this star creating once it reaches to the hydrogen. Uh, sorry, it reaches to the iron making stage, there is no more nuclear fuel left for the star to fuse. It means there are no more light coming out, no more photons coming out. It means there is no outward pressure to counteract the gravity and the star collapses under its own gravity in less than a second. Now, I am writing here or I am saying here that this collapse leads to an explosion which is named as either supernova or gamma ray burst. But that is that is a very controversial statement how a collapse is leading into an explosion and I will get come to it in a in a while when I try to explain little more. But, but let us let us uh, try to understand in this scenario of stellar evolution what these different kind of transients are. So, when the star runs out of its nuclear fuel, then there is no more outward pressure to hold the gravity. It means the star collapses under its own gravity and that collapse at some point involving some complex physics turns into an explosion which are marked as one of the most explosive events in the universe which are supernovae and gamma ray bursts. So, in this big picture of stellar evolution, uh, evolution of stars of various masses, 
Let us look at some of these transients. So, core collapse supernovae. What are core collapse supernovae? Core collapse supernovae in these stars, these are the result of explosion of stars which are most likely heavier than 8 times mass of the sun. And as I told you uh, in a minute back, they make iron at the core and after that the implosion will turn into explosion and it will be a gravitation collapse of the massive star. Gravitation collapse because it is the gravity which is uh, which is leading to the collapse of the massive star and the gravitational potential energy is the one which comes out in this explosion and this energy is huge. This is 10 to the power 53 ergs of energy and this kind of energy out of this energy 99 percent of the energy is carried by neutrinos and only 1 percent comes out as radiation or photons or electromagnetic energy and that is enough to outshine the whole galaxy. One such explosion in our Milky Way galaxy will outshine whole of the Milky Way for that duration. Now, thermonuclear supernovae, these are also very exotic objects though they are little different from core collapse supernovae because here gravitation collapse is not the one which is deriving the explosion. But these, in these supernovae the star the progenitor of this supernovae is 4 to 8 solar mass star. So, it is heavier than sun, but not heavy enough to have a explosion by itself. So, in such a star, the end of the life cycle of this star, it will make a white dwarf, which will be not like sun, but heavier than sun kind of a white dwarf. And if such a white dwarf happens to come in the territory of another star, then this star because of this white dwarf which has a very high gravity, it will it will accrete mass, it will collect mass from this, this companion and then it reaches a certain it violates certain quantum mechanics law or something which is which is given by Chandrasekhar mass limit. When it exceeds that mass, then there will be these thermal runaway reactions and the whole star will collapse an explosion will take place and which is called thermonuclear uh, supernovae. And these are one of the very important kind of explosions because these are the explosions which, which actually told us that universe is not only expanding, but accelerating. And in 2008 uh, or 7, the Nobel Prize was given for this kind of work. Now, long gamma ray bursts as I told you uh, some time back, these are the bursts which have duration of more than 2 seconds and in these 2 seconds they outshine the rest of the universe and this, this duration is of course in the gamma rays that is why the name is gamma ray burst and in these, these gamma ray bursts are supposed to be collapse of a very massive star, a star which is more than 30, 40 solar mass ok, which means in these stars. So, when I told you about the long, the core collapse supernovae, what happens is that the, when the whole star collapses and an explosion happens and at the center it is expected to make a neutron star. Whereas, in these gamma ray bursts, it is expected to form a black hole at the center and the rest of the star is supposed to blow out and this explosion this star will blow out with very high speeds. These speeds will reach up to 90 to 99 percent of the speed of light. Now, there are second kind of gamma ray bursts, short gamma ray burst. These are the bursts which have duration less than 2 seconds. In these bursts, it is a collapse of two compact objects, which means suppose there is a white dwarf or and a neutron star or two neutron stars when they come together because of gravity, they will come together, they will attract each other and finally, they will spiral in and collapse and that will lead to the explosion which is called short gamma ray bursts. In this picture, it is very clear on the left, you can see that there is a big star and it is exploding as a gamma ray burst. On the right, you can see these two tiny dots which are revolving around each other <coughs> coming together and giving rise to short gamma ray bursts. Gravitational waves are well in this diagram, there are various sources of gravitational waves. 
In this plot on the x axis, I have plotted frequency on the y axis, it is the strain or in some sense amplitude of the gravitational waves and high ELF, VLF, LF and HF are extremely low frequency, very low frequency, low frequency and high frequency. So, there are different kinds of gravitational waves, different sources of gravitational waves, but on our ground, uh, on earth based interferometers, they can detect gravitational waves from collapse of or merger of two compact objects. And these are the ones and of course, you can imagine intuitively that when two black holes will merge, that will create a very strong gravitational waves. Okay. Light from the gravitational wave, as black hole sucks everything in, if a gravitational waves are produced from merger of two black holes, you will not see light from these gravitational waves. You will see the light from gravitational waves if at least one of the compact object is a neutron star. And if you recall just some time back, I told you that two compact objects spiraling in will give rise to short gamma ray bursts. It means we think that gravitational waves are produced in these short gamma ray bursts or if you want to think vice versa, when these two compact object merges, they give rise to this gravitational wave and at the same time, these electromagnetic light or photons come out in the gamma ray band. And I would like to tell you that until last year, this was only a conjecture, but now we have some proof of these things, which I will come to it very soon. Fast radio burst, I would say that how much ever exotic objects these are, these are the most enigmatic in nature. We think a compact object is involved because to give rise to this kind of energy, we do not know any other phenomena in the nature which can give rise to such energies. All we know from measurements, from seeing from uh, radio telescopes are that they are not in our galaxy or I would say most likely not in our galaxy, they are cosmological events at ratio of one, uh, 0.5 to 1 and even further away. All right. So, now after telling you all these, I think it is little bit confusing. So, I am going to show you some of the animations and these are certainly not the real animations because um, these are artist impression of the phenomena as we astronomers understand them. And you can appreciate that it is actually not possible to see these kind of phenomena in, in with our eyes because these things are happening at time scale and length scale which we cannot probe. All we get from telescopes are photons in different energies and, in, and then we try to make this, this picture uh, of the phenomena and then we, we test this picture by, by trying to invoke some physics and if the, if the predictions of these physical phenomena are matching with our observations or not. So, here you can see a core collapse supernova, this is a star. You can, uh, so initially you would see that something is happening inside the star and but we do not know what is happening and then the explosion happened and this is the star which is exploding outside. You can see again something is happening inside the star and then it exploded. So, what something was happening inside the star was nuclear fusion reactions taking place and uh, the outer layers of the star were oblivious to this fact and when uh, the star collapsed and then finally exploded and then this, this there is a neutron star at the center and then this, this material came out. In fact, at this point I would like to tell you is that this material is what is actually responsible for our existence. In the universe, when the universe started with say big bang, there was not enough density and temperature to do the fusion of any heavy element than helium and maybe little bit of lithium. All this oxygen we breathe, iron which is in our cars, calcium in our teeth, everything was synthesized inside a star and when that star exploded as a supernova and when the new stars formed, those new stars which in this case is our sun had all these heavy elements and, and that is how we all are into this ex into existence. Okay. Now, I am going to show you uh, a thermonuclear supernova. 
this tiny object at the center is that big white dwarf which was created from a 4 to 8 solar mass star and that white dwarf when it came close to another star, white dwarf is accreting mass from this bigger star and then when it exceeds a phenomena called Chandrasekhar mass limit, it explodes and that is called thermonuclear supernova. Here the same star, but it is much more massive something is happening inside and then this this explosion happens, but you see the explosion is very directive. If, if my earth is not in this direction of the rays, there is no way I can see these gamma ray bursts. I get to see them only those which are pointed towards that earth. Okay. And there are dedicated telescopes which are revolving around the earth and looking for these kind of bursts and observing them and then there are these robotic uh, telescopes which automatically move towards that direction and try to observe these gamma ray bursts. All right, these are gamma ray bursts. These are all artists impression, but very realistic impression. So, here what is happening inside you know this is uh, like why it is directional and why is it coming out like this. For that I would like to show you this cartoon diagram where you can see at the core there is a black hole and the matter which was falling in because of the collapse just to conserve the angular momentum it is accreting uh, around its rotational axis and then this explosion is happening along the rotational axis and this whole thing is coming out. Okay. Now this is the short gamma ray burst where these two say neutron stars are coming together and together and together and finally, they collapse makes most likely a black hole and explodes as a gamma ray burst. Okay, so, inside mechanism is very different, but out, output is more or less same as the long burst. Now, if you recall the gravitational waves, the same collapse, same merger, the when it was, it was giving rise to photons for our telescopes, but if you are having a gravitational wave interferometer, it is giving rise to this deformation in the space time and these deformations which we are calling gravitational waves and this is what we have observed with telescopes or interferometers called advanced LIGO. See here these two objects are merging and merging and then they are giving rise to these huge gravitational waves. And we detectors on the earth are observing them. Okay. So, these are some of the artistic impressions and I am not even showing the artistic impression of fast radio bursts because we do not know what is the mechanism behind that. So, in all of these we saw that gravity is the main source of energy and gravity is the one which leads to collapse of these stars. However, at some point this collapse turns into explosion. How does that happen? Intuitively try, you can try to imagine this that when there is an iron at the core the star is collapsing under its own gravity. It collapses so much that it becomes this solid ball and when anything or you can imagine a wall and if you throw something on that wall it bounces back. Okay. So, rest, so when there is this solid uh, ball at the core and rest of the material which is falling or hitting this solid ball, it is, it is going back and that going back is basically the explosion. However, it is not as easy as it sounds because it turns out that the material which is falling in and it is, it, for it to go back and explode is not that easy. One needs to incorporate uh, general relativity, magneto hydrodynamic simulations and lot of fine tuning of physics is needed and unfortunately, we are still at a stage where we are still trying to understand these things and in this diagram if I show you it is the time on the x axis and it is the radius on the y axis. So, this is the star you can see it is actually collapsing under its own gravity and then suddenly you see this boom it is going out the very high radius means that is explosion. So, you see some stars are exploding 
So, these are basically simulations which are carried out on one of the some of the biggest super com computers on earth and in some cases the if you change the conditions of neutrinos or put some extra physics. So, there are some explosions which are happening, some are not happening. So, basically I want to say that magnetic field, rotation, neutrino physics all these play very crucial role and which we still do not understand. And this is a very active area of research and uh, some of us are trying to understand these phenomena as technology is advancing and more and more better and better and faster and faster supercomputers are coming up. And these are different kind of supernovae depending upon what kind of star was exploding and that gives rise to different kind of outputs. There is only one thing which is fixed and that is the gravitational potential energy turning into the explosion energy which is more or less 10 to the power 51 ergs. Okay, so, how do we study these things? Uh, eyes are not enough or in some sense optical telescopes are not enough. Everything gives complementary information. It is exactly the same way if you are looking a human being with the eye, you will see the outer features, you will see eyes, nose and clothes and skin. But if you, if you put the man through an x-ray, you will see the bone structure and if you want to understand the full what is, what is that human being, you have to actually these two uh, bands can create a complementary, they will give you complementary information. So, similarly we try to understand these objects with multi wave bands or photons in different energies, different frequencies, different wavelength. The fact is that not everything thing can be observed on earth. If we have to study in say gamma rays or x rays, we have to go beyond earth's atmosphere because earth's atmosphere absorbs this radiation. It is only some window of optical and a window of radio which you can see in this plot that is where those are the things which those are the telescopes which we can have on earth and rest of the telescopes we have to move it or put it in satellites and uh, put it put them beyond earth's atmosphere and NASA is doing sending lot of such satellites and we are trying to study this uh, phenomena with these telescopes. So, optical radiation in supernovae for example, last only for a month or so that is because once these heavy elements are created, there are these radioactive elements will also get created and decay of these radioactive elements will give rise to optical radiation. X-ray radiation will come just because this explosive plasma is so uh, hot and in such a high density environment. Radio radiation comes from some complex physics which we call non-thermal synchrotron radiation. In this, in this physics what happens is it is like it is a relativistic version of cyclotron radiation where these electrons is spiraling in magnetic field can reach relativistic energies and then they can emit what is called synchrotron radiation which is nothing but a relativistic version of cyclotron radiation. So, what we try to understand is we try to we are trying to look the uh, the aftermath after the explosion and I name them circumstellar interaction. Uh, what does that mean? The, what that means is that I am trying to understand these phenomena after the explosion has taken place and trying to recreate the history of explosion based on these observations. And what do I use for this fact? I use the fact that outer layer of these stars or progenitor stars are losing its mass. For example, our sun also you see these solar winds, these are nothing but the mass lost from the sun and sun is losing mass with a rate of 10 to the power minus 14 solar mass per year. And these stars will lose mass, the stars I am talking about will lose mass much higher with much higher rate than the sun and they can reach up to 10 to the power minus 5, minus 4 solar masses per year. Now, this mass loss carries imprints of the progenitor and when I observe these imprints with my telescope and I observe it multiple times at different epochs, I can try to recreate the history of those footprints of the star and try to understand the star. And this is how 
we try to study these supernovae interactions. In fact, if we study in the radio bands, which is the highest wavelength or lowest frequency, much of the radiation is absorbed and in this formula, which look little complicated and I do not want you to get into this, but I just want to show you that there is a term uh, in the, there are two things, synchrotron self absorption. In the synchrotron self absorption, f is the flux and tau is the optical depth and optical depth you can see is proportional to uh, n relativistic, which is relativistic electrons and b, which is magnetic field. So, it means if you observe synchrotron absorption, you have information about the magnetic field of the system, you have information about the relativistic electrons and how they are changing with time. Similarly, if you have the physics of which is called free free absorption, which means these free ionized particles are absorbing the radiation or photons that depends upon the m dot, which is mass being lost from the star and that mass being lost is nothing but the footprint of the star. So, this is how we recreate or in some sense we, we go back and try to understand or we use something called time machine phenomena and try to understand these kind of explosions. Gamma ray bursts are little different because there is not so much, there is a black hole at the center which has uh, uh, engulfed much of the material, there is not so much of you know there is there are not enough particles, there is not enough plasma to recreate the situation like in supernovae. So, much of the radiation is what is I just told you is the non thermal version or relativistic version of cyclotron radiation that is synchrotron radiation and gamma ray bursts are now seen in optical x-ray radio and they are all non thermal synchrotron radiation. Just to give you a sense if you have studied cyclotron in your undergrad courses, just to give you a sense, just to release radio photons, these electrons which have half MeV of mass have to reach to GeV kind of energies to give rise to these kind of radiation. And this is a three dimensional plot of such a synchrotron radiation. On the x axis, this is the frequency on the y axis this is time and on the z axis this is the intensity and then as you can see at later and low, later times at lower and lower frequency the intensity and the peak goes to the lower and lower frequency at later and later times. So, you can actually observe it at different times, different epochs for minutes to years and then try to recreate the whole history of gamma ray bursts and how the radiations were produced. And the same phenomena since gravitational waves, electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves are nothing but you know uh, the collapse of two compact objects which again give rise to gamma ray bursts. Same physics applies to electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves. Fast radio bursts, I will again repeat, it has been seen only in the radio frequencies, it has in fact mostly seen in 1.4 gigahertz frequency and we have observed only handful of them, maybe 30, 35 of them and they happen for milliseconds and only one such burst uh, has shown to be repeating many times. Other bursts just happens for millisecond and then they are over and nothing left is left to be seen. So, we are still puzzled that what are these fast radio bursts. In fact, few years back uh, people thought that they actually saw the near counterparts of these fast radio bursts which turned out to be man made phenomena. So, we are still back to square one and not able to understand what these things are. So, in the third part of the talk, I will talk about some of the recent developments in this, uh, in this field and uh, what are the burning problems and where one can contribute and then I will give you some of the resources. So, in supernovae, if you recall, it is the gravitational collapse of a very massive star and since the physics is very fixed, we, uh, we think and we understand that the energy output or how much explosion energy is come out should be quite fixed. However, it has been seen 
especially since more sensitive telescopes have come and they are surveying the sky to look for more and more of such supernovae. That there are several supernovae which are actually much more brighter than the supernovae we think physics will allow from the gravitational collapse of massive star. So, this is, this is in some sense a problem because we are not able to explain them from the physics we know of and these, but, but they, they do exist and they, they are realistic supernovae and there are several such supernovae and one of them you can see in this plot the highest one with the, uh, with the points are uh, stars are uh, is a, is the one which has much higher brightness. And these are termed as super luminous supernovae because they are more luminous than normal supernovae. So, what current understanding is that there are many theories that they are probably this supernovae from the stars which were the first stars after the big bang. There are theories of some pair instabilities taking place and so there are multiple theories and they are invoking some exotic quantum mechanics uh, at the center. They are, they are they are trying to explain is it with anything and everything, but now there is some convergence happening and people are thinking that these supernovae are being uh, are mo more bright because these stars are very massive and they are losing mass with much higher speed and then and much higher rate. And if you recall I told you that the optical supernovae or if you see with them with the optical telescope these supernovae are because of the radioactive decay of heavy, heavy elements. Now, I think we understand that on top of this radioactive decay, this, this mass lost from the star is also playing a role and that is adding to this energy and giving rise to this extra push in the energy. And this I just some time back told you that stars are losing mass and we are seeing it in the radio band and x-ray band. But if the mass loss rate is extremely high, not 10 to the power minus 5 solar masses per year, but say 10 to the power minus 2 solar mass per year, then you can create such conditions. The problem is that stellar evolution models which we understand do not predict such high mass loss from the star. However, people scientists are working on such models and they have come up with some mass ranges which are 8 to 10 solar mass, 17 to 25 solar mass and more than 35 solar mass stars where they claim that there could be conditions where there could be some kind of instabilities and that can, that can give rise to very high mass loss and those mass loss in the presence of such high density due to the mass loss or in terms of solar. Uh, if you want to think an, uh, of an analogy with solar, these dense solar winds or star winds, they can give rise to emission in optical bands and they can give rise to these super luminous supernovae. And some evidence it has been seen in fact by our group where we saw the, where we, we observe one such supernova with uh, X-ray telescopes, with NASA X-ray telescope. And in these five plots, I am showing you the column density or absorption around the supernovae. And this absorption is changing with time and which would happen if there is so much of mass around the supernova that it is some of it is left unionized. And that can give rise to these and when we, when we calculate the mass lost based on these plots, this mass loss comes out to be 10 to the power minus 1 solar mass per year. So, which means that observations are suggesting that indeed there are supernovae which are directly telling you that the kind of mass loss which is needed to produce these superluminous supernovae is happening in some supernovae. So, this is one of the interesting field of research uh, in which our group is also interested. Now, in gamma ray burst this as gamma rays are hard, hard to focus and these bursts happen for a few seconds and they uh, happen without announcing themselves. There are these dedicated telescopes mainly Swift and Fermi, they are just revolving around the earth and looking for such kind of bursts and because of them we have some thousands of gamma ray bursts known 
and we not only have the gamma ray bursts in gamma ray band, we also have the afterglows. It means they are glowing after, after the explosion in lower and lower frequencies, which means when I say afterglow, it means they have been seen in x-ray, optical and even radio. And we have even seen the gamma ray bursts from very far away in the universe. In fact, the higher, highest redshift gamma ray burst so far is happened uh, in 2009 and it is at a redshift of 8.3. Now, just to give you a feel for this redshift, if our universe is say 14 billion years old, then redshift of 8.3 corresponds to a age of universe when universe was 0.7 billion years only. What that means is that this explosion happened when the universe was 0.7 billion years old and it, it took these photons or these light to arrive to us around 13.3 billion years and now we are seeing these things. How that explosion looks right now, we will get to know only after 13.3 billion years later. So, this is how uh, the astrophysics goes, we are always looking in the past because nothing can travel beyond the speed of light and we are looking for very far away phenomena. And not by studying this kind of burst, we not only just study the burst, we also see how the burst is taking place, what are the environments. It means we are probing the universe, the environment of the universe at such high redshift or such back in time. So, these are, um, these are some of the very active areas of research. And with radio telescopes and I am talking more about radio telescopes because in India we host world's largest low frequency radio telescope which is called giant meter wave radio telescope and much of these studies have come out of this giant meter wave radio telescope which is just 80 kilometers from Pune. So, you can actually observe these shocks which we call reverse shocks in these gamma ray bursts and which can tell you how fast these bursts are moving. And this is how we have, we, we understand that their Lorentz factor is nothing but a measure of the speed of this, this ejected, this explosion and we see that they are moving with up to 99 percent of the speed of light. Okay. Gravitational wave, the first gravitational wave was detected in September of 2015 which is a very recent event by advanced LIGO and this gravitational wave event occurred because of merging of two around 30 solar mass black holes and since it is black hole you can intuitively think that there was no light from these gravitational waves. So, they were seen only with gravitational wave interferometers. We till now we know only 5 gravitational wave events. But these five gravitational wave events have given us lots of information and we now know for real that black holes do exist. Until now we only, we, the astrophysics needed black holes to exist, but there was no direct evidence of black holes. We also know that gravitational waves move with the speed of light. We know, we, we have lot more information about cosmology constraints on Hubble constant. So, these gravitational waves have given us lot of information and one of the five gravitational wave event happened not because of merger of black hole, but because of merger of two neutron stars. Now, in two neutron stars you can imagine that light will come out okay, because there are these particles which are creating electromagnetic radiation. And which was true, we saw the light in gamma rays, which we saw the light in x rays and radio and it again confirmed for the first time that gravitational waves merger of two compact objects indeed produce gravitational wave as well as short gamma ray bursts. And our, we are still observing these bursts with all the radio telescopes in the world. Why are the radio telescopes? Because they are the lowest frequency it means they are the lowest energy. When gamma rays are gone in, in few hours, optical is gone in less than 15 days and x-ray is gone in hundreds of days, radio is still, uh, the, 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 the event is still emitting in radio waves and we are observing it with various telescopes and they are telling 
if you see this light curve which is time versus the intensity it is telling us this shape is telling us that how a jet was launched which gave rise to this short gamma ray burst from this gravitational wave event. If you want to understand it more I have written the, the reference. This is a paper by our team led by Kunal Mule of Caltech and NRO and uh, this paper tells a lot more about this event. And we actually have a picture now because of this study of this event. Now, when I say 170817, it just means that it was detected on 17th of August 2017. We have a picture of how the neutron star must have merged, how it must have ejected some of the material, how because of the conservation of angular momentum, a jet must have come out and when it had interacted with this medium, how the shocks must be produced, which gave rise to the radio and x-ray emission, whereas this ejecta, the radioactive elements from this ejecta undergoing something called R process, which you may have studied in undergrad, that may have given rise to heavy elements. In fact, much of the gold and platinum comes from these kind of merger events. So, this is a very big event and big victory for astronomers because they understood and in 2017 Nobel Prize was given for gravitational wave detection. So, it is a very important uh, discovery. Another good news is that right now the gravitational wave interferometers are in US and in uh, Virgo which is a Italy and Germany collaboration and one is coming in Japan which is Kagura. However, there is a proposal for having a gravitational wave interferometer in India also and uh, everybody the astronomers working in this field are looking forward to it and this is the time to get into the research of gravitational waves. Okay, fast radio burst, I am only writing about the FRB 121102 which means it was detected on 2nd November in 2012. This is in the recent developments of fast radio bursts, when we know nothing about them, there is this one burst which has been different than all other 35 or more or less this number known of fast radio bursts. Why is that so? Because this is the one which did not die once for all. It has been shown to repeat giving rise to bursts. It has given more than 100 burst of these radio burst and we for sure know that it is not in our galaxy, it is at a redshift of 0.2. We still do not know the origin, but um, the studies are still going on and this is, this has turned out to be one of the most exotic fast radio bursts and some of the Indian astronomers are very deeply involved in this, in, in this work and uh, astronomers are still trying to understand and hopefully next decade or so the mystery of fast radio burst will be solved. So, now after talking about these transients and this is a very general overview of these transients, I want to give you some of the very basic resources with which you will have much more deeper understanding of these transient objects and here uh, on the top I have given you the names of the books. If you are getting into this field, it is better to start with these books and these are all recent books and they all start from the basic and then they go to the complex of physics and these are first two are for supernovae and the second third one is for supernovae as well as gamma ray bursts. Okay, so, these are the three books and then for gamma ray bursts, uh, this, these are some of the books which you can read and get deeper understanding. Right now, there is no book on fast radio bursts and gravitational waves, uh, at least electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave. There are papers, but no books because these are very recent phenomena, but I am sure in few years from now, some books, some nice books will be written on those. In the meantime, I want to give you one of the most important resource for uh, uh, for understanding the uh, or getting to know the most recent research happening in these fields and this is called archive astro ph 
and on top you, you can see the web address and why I am giving you this resource because it does not need you for you or your institute to register for this and pay to avail this service. All the papers come on these and every day you can subscribe to it and every day there are around 50 to 60 papers which astronomers all over the world submit to Astro PH and you can click on any paper you are interested in and then you can read that paper and this will keep you up to date with most recent uh, research in in any field of astrophysics and you can actually look for the transients if you are interested in. So, I think with this uh, I will end my talk, my lecture. Thank you.